This is Space Invaders as it appeared in arcades in 1978. This game, which was built by Tomohiro Nishikado, was a massive blockbuster and is credited with creating the space shooter genre. We'll see if we can duplicate the basics of this game ourselves on the iPhone over a few short videos. Let's briefly analyze the game screen and identify important elements. We can see that there is a player spaceship that moves side to side, placed near the bottom of the game field. The player can fire shots up at the aliens. The aliens are arranged in a group of five rows and 11 aliens across. The aliens all move together as a group as the game progresses, and when they hit the side of the game field, they drop down, reverse direction, and start to move a little faster. If you look closely while the game is playing out, the alien shots hit the ground and disappear, and the player shots can hit the top border of the screen and disappear. The player cannot go off the side of the field, and the shots from the player will destroy the aliens. Now that we have a general idea of the rules of the game, we can design our iPhone app to match those specs. My primary goal isn't to teach you how SpriteKit works. I'm more interested in showing how I solve problems and achieve goals using this framework. So let's begin by opening Xcode and creating a new project. The project type will be game and the target will be iOS. I'm going to call my project Cosmic Attackers. Resize this to fit on my stream. There we go. When you create a new game project with Xcode, there will already be some items inside. This is mostly just code that is included so that there is more than just a black window supplied by Apple when you first run it. We won't be needing any of this, so however, so I'm going to delete everything that I'm not planning to use. I don't need the supplied game scene SKS file, nor the actions SKS file, nor the game scene file that has the Swift extension. I will delete these and make my own. Starting in the game view controller, the view did load function contains some lines of code in it that Apple has included to load their sample files. We're going to get rid of those. As of now, we have a completely blank project file that doesn't actually do anything. We're going to create everything from scratch. Our primary class will be called Gameplay Scene. In many games, you'll subclass SK Scene several times in order to build different sections of your game. You might have a title scene, a game over scene, a credit scene, a high score scene, and so on. We'll begin making our own by choosing New and File. You'll choose a Swift file. iOS is the target. Press Next. And we're going to call this Gameplay Scene. Remove the reference to Foundation and instead import SpriteKit. We'll put one class inside and call it Gameplay Scene. And it will inherit from SK Scene. This class requires two init functions that we need to define. For the first one, I'll just call the superclass. For the second one, this is if our class is instantiated via file instead of manually through code. I'm not going to be using this. Oops, learn a spell. If this should be called unintentionally, I'll just throw a fatal error. Lastly, just a test. I'm going to define did move to view, and I'm going to set the background to blue so that I know that this is in my view or not. Was Xcode auto completing? Background color equals SK color dot blue. 
done with this file. Now we need to go back to the GameView controller and replace the lines that we removed. In the GameView controller, in the method view did load, I'm going to instantiate my game scene. Let's see equal gameplay scene. And then I need to supply the size. This will be 640 units across and 960 units tall. I'll then tell the framework to scale my world unit or my scene to cover the entire iPhone screen by using aspect fit. Next, we need to access the sprite kit view. We do that by casting the UI kit view to an SK view. We can set some attributes. Show FPS equals true. And we might also want to show physics. And then we definitely want to show the node count. That's how many sprites are in our scene. Lastly, we want to attach the gameplay scene that we instantiated onto this view. We do that with present scene. This is enough code to display gameplay scene, let it initialize its background, and then it will loop forever at just a blue screen if things have gone correctly. Let's give it a try. There's our simulator. We got ourselves a blue screen. We're doing great. Next, let's create our game field. I'll create a new Swift file and name this one Game Border. Delete the reference to Foundation and import Sprite Kit. I'm going to define the game border as an SK shape node. In a shape node, you send a core graphics path to Sprite Kit, and it will render that path in your scene like any other sprite. To set this up, under init, we will create a CG mutable path, add a rectangle that is the width of our device and half of the height. And then we will assign that path to the SK shape nodes built in path property. We will then set a stroke color and thickness for this path. I'm choosing white and a thickness of four. I then set the position of the sprite to be at 0480, which is exactly the middle of my screen. I will give the sprite a name of bounds, which will come in handy later. Let us return to the gameplay scene after we clear these errors. I forgot my equal sign. I forgot my override keyword. I also forgot that pesky required init, but Xcode will insert it for me. This is again, we're not going to use this. Now let's return to the game view controller, or gameplay scene. Here, we'll want to create an instance of the game border. Then, in our did move to view function, we'll need to add it as a child. We can now run and make sure that we see a white square identifying the game field. There it is. OK, let's continue with the player. We'll make a new file, Swift file. We'll call this one player. Remove foundation, import sprite kit. This would be another SK shape node. So in the init, we'll call the superclass, and then we'll set up the path again. In our version of Space Invaders, the player will just be a triangle. So that is the path that we will create. To make this triangle, I'm going to start the path 
go to CG point will be zero by zero to start. And then we will do a line from zero, zero to, let's say, 32 cross and zero high. So that's a line straight across. Add another line. Let's see what we got here. Let's say to the midpoint. 16 by 32. So that's a line sideways, then a line diagonal. To close it, my typing path that close subpath that'll automatically give me a line back to the first point that I started at, which was this zero zero. And I'll assign this path to my sprite. We'll do the usual stroke color, skip color white and line width will equal four pixels. I'll set the default, help if I spelled SK node properly. The default position will be, let's say, if we want to position this in the middle, 304 across by maybe four pixels up, just so he's slightly off the game field border. And then we will give him a name of player, which we'll use later. And then these really fun required nits, we will just have Xcode pop it in for us. Okay, that should be enough to draw a triangle on the screen. Let's go back to our gameplay scene. Let's add him in here as player equals new player object. And for this one, we'll do game border add child. So the player will be underneath of the game border itself. And if we run it in this fashion, we should be able to see a little triangle on the screen that's white, mid center of our game field, just off the bottom. Hey, we did okay, we got a triangle. Let's keep going. Okay. Let's finish out part one by allowing you to move the player around whenever you touch the iPhone screen. I'll begin by adding a variable called last touch. And this is a CG point representing where the person is currently touching the screen. We then need to override the touch functions. I gotta tell you, there's no easy way to do this. So I'm just gonna copy paste because there's a lot of them. We'll only be tracking the first touch. So in touches began and touches moved, we're gonna update the CG point tracking where the player's finger currently is on the screen. So that would be the touches set, first element, and that's the location in the current view. After we have that, we're gonna say that the last touch equals this location. We'll do an identical procedure for when the touch moves. When the touch is ended, we'll just zero it out. Okay, next, what do we do with that touch? Let's override, update, and decide what to do there. The last touch is something that we'd want to use to position the player sprite. So let's go to the player class and begin to track this here. I'm going to use the physics engine to move this uh, sprite around. And in order to do that, we need to assign a physics body. I'm going to use the polygon initializer. I'm going to use the path that I use to draw the sprite. 
If you're using a shape node, making a physics body is a cinch. You just feed it the path and you're done. I'm going to turn off gravity and rotation. Now we've got enough information for the system to track this as a physical object. I'm then going to go to game scene. I'm going to modify update. We'll tell the player to update and move towards the where the player's finger currently is. Let's go define that. Bonk, update, touching, touch. This is a CG point. All right, that should unwrap it. Now let's find out how far away from the current finger position the sprite of the player is. So what I'd like to do is calculate how fast the player sprite should move when I tap the screen. I'm going to check the distance between the sprite and my finger and up to a certain maximum that I guess we'll arbitrarily pick as 16. We will move him at either maximum speed if I tap far away and if I tap right next to the player sprite, it will only move a little bit and very slowly. Now that I've calculated a maximum speed based upon how far the player sprite is away from the player's finger on the screen itself, I'll just assign a vector to the current physics body to start it moving. I'll use velocity equals a CG vector. This is going to take an X and a Y coordinate as the speed and direction. And I will use the speed variable. I'm gonna multiply it out a little bit in order to magnify its effects. And we're only gonna slide horizontally so there'll be no Y component. This should be enough information to try and run. You got it. Wherever I'm clicking and holding, I'm seeing that the player moves there. I do have one problem, of course, which is that it doesn't slow down and it doesn't stay on the field. Let's fix that now. For the game border, let's give it a physics body. We're going to use an edge loop, which is a hollow square. And I failed to type that one properly. Edge loop from the path we're using to draw that square. This one is not affected by gravity. And this one does not rotate. Let's try again. Now the player cannot go off the edges of the screen. You will notice, though, if you click, the player just keeps moving forever by tapping. If you release, it will always go all the way to the edge. What we need to do is simulate a little bit of friction. So I'll go to the player, modify his physics body a little bit. We'll use linear damping, and I'll try a value of 1.0 and see how that goes. It's not bad. The player slows down once I've let go of the mouse. Getting pretty close. Let's increase it to two and see if we like the way that that looks. I'm fairly happy with that, so I'll leave it there for now. You might change this to another value as you proceed. So, so far, in about 15 minutes, we've got our sprites on the screen and they remove in response to our touches. Let's go ahead and pause there, and we'll begin part two, adding the aliens.